long time. It's on me though, because I haven't followed up with the doctor himself. How you doing, bro? I'm doing great. I mean, it's rare to start off with someone saying your name correctly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm kind of taken aback by that right there. You nailed it. We got to say it the right way, man. Uh, especially in 2021, it's Armando <laughs> Gonzalez. Uh, also there it is Mondo. There it is. Yeah. Also is Mondo. We're talking Kings basketball, uh, mental health, uh, how the NBA has combated with that negative stigma, potential NBA trades. I know you're a huge Kings fan, and yeah, and huge. you were mentioning that uh, you actually started off as a broadcaster. So we'll we'll get into that. But before we do all that, man, huge shout out to Valley tire center uh, a great sponsor of this platform my recommendation for everybody is to continue to support your local businesses please y'all they they need it more than ever right now with this pandemic going on every single business needs you guys are the backbone of america and the more you support the better we'll all be man so shout out to valley tire center for that, you guys can follow Dr. Mondo on Instagram at the Dr. Mondo. Uh, great follow, lots of great information as always. So, without further ado, man, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, appreciate you having me, man. I, I'm a mental health therapist. I have a doctorate of psychology, and uh, yeah, I'm just passionate about helping people. I'm passionate about not just helping people, but I really believe a lot in transformational uh, change. I believe it's possible. And uh, the field in general of mental health has been set up in a way that often um, promotes symptom management. And I'm really passionate about figuring out how to get the cheat codes to really unlock transformational healing. In other words, I don't believe that you know, if there's certain struggles we have or certain traumas we've been through that we have to necessarily uh, get used to living with them our entire lives. I believe that there are transformational healing practices in, in the therapy world. Um, we're seeing those emerge in research. And so I'm passionate about unlocking those. And I, and my heart is to work with anyone and everyone. So I work with, with people um, who, are, who are locked up and I work with people all the way on the other end of the spectrum um, in society's eyes um, in terms of elite, elite athletes. Um, and so I just have a heart for helping pretty much anyone that wants to do the work and anyone who wants to achieve a high level of goals, that, that's what I'm about. Um, I think the other thing I'll mention too is that, you know, a lot of that during pandemic, a lot shifted and my, a lot of my focus shifted really to trying to do something bigger then not not saying that you know the practice here in Sacramento wasn't something that I felt was making an impact. Right. But um, I've really wanted to do something bigger, and so we started Cheat Code, and we started the Cheat Code Foundation, which I could tell you more about. Um, mm -hmm. But that's what really shifted my my lens to where the majority of folks I work with are either those elite level athletes um, or uh, they're folks on the foundation side, where we're helping people in underserved communities get the same type of services that I would provide to the elite level athletes. That's big time because as you know, DeMar DeRozan, Kevin Love, Trey Young, even uh, Pandemic P, which is uh, my boy from the uh, Clippers, Paul George, <laughs> he talked about during that bubble how he was just so screwed up not being around family and just yeah. from a mental perspective how tough that was obviously that's not my area of expertise that's what you maybe you can kind of uh, delve into in a little bit but how the NBA has really supported that movement how they're taking a stance against mental health stigma and both you and I being Mexican American we know better than everybody, than anybody the Mexican male is so prideful and there's a term called machismo that machismo. yeah that is a real thing that we never want to go to a doctor that, uh, unless we're dying we ain't going to the ER and I've been no, guilty no. of that myself so that's definitely something that we should talk about and and how we can help ourselves in those situations and 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 how in in your opinion how much it's benefited guys coming out coming out and talking about mental health issues at the NBA level which is a huge thing because little kids look up to these guys right they're, they're role models and them now being open to talking about something that's been going on for so long, I think it's going to really help a lot of people. 
Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, growing up for me, um, I not only, you know, growing up, of course, being exposed to machismo and being exposed to some of the, you know, terms like toxic masculinity. And yeah. essentially when it comes to mental health, it's just it's real simple. It's the, look, you're weak uh, if, if you're struggling. And so you keep that to yourself, man. Like, don't don't let anyone know about it. Figure it out. And if you can't, then there's something wrong with you. You know, that's the old guard, the old way of thinking about it. Um, a lot of what made me passionate about getting into this work was my own experience as a kid going to therapy. Uh, you know, and so um, I think what the what the league is doing and what we're doing as a society and culture is we are shifting that narrative, not just for the sake of shifting it, but also because it's just not true. And what I mean by that is this, is that, you know, the athletes are they named the, the company we have cheat code. And the reason they did is because they started coming in working on their mentals and they went out on the field and people were like, bro, what's, what's different about you? You know, you, you're moving different. You're moving better. You're more fluid. You change up your diet. Like, what are you doing? What's, and he said, bro, I got a cheat code. And we kept <laughs> hearing that from athletes. And essentially to me, there's no better way to describe what working on your mental health is. It's a cheat code. And, um, and I think it's time that, you know, we start framing it in those terms. And, you know, when you talk about athletes, I look to so many growing up as many of us did and, 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 and many kids still do. Yep. And with that platform does come a certain level of responsibility, despite what my favorite player growing up, Charles Barkley said, uh, <laughs> there is, a, there is, a, there is a, st- there is a, a certain level of being a role model and something you're going to do with that platform. And I love what, what guys are doing now and using that platform to be honest and vulnerable. And I think that's how we break stigma, man. Like that's why I, I say it's, I don't like when people say stigma against mental illness because I'm more of talking about mental health struggles, mental health struggles. Every single one of you, I'm talking everyone listening right now, you have mental health struggles. So do I, right? We all do. We can all Me relate too. to that. Me that's too. the stigma we need to get down to breaking and talking about because when we do even the act of owning it out loud that is that's a moment of empowerment and that's what i love about what's happened in the league and what what not just the nba but the nfl and a lot of the guys i work with in major league baseball they're just passionate and they're and they're really ready to share their stories we've never seen that before that's that's big time and even for someone like me right who I don't compare myself to other people who have struggled from it a lot more than I have. But, for example, as I was telling you off air, how when March 11th, I think, was the last game when it was Kings Pelicans and then the whole NBA went down and, like, the whole world essentially shut down. Um, At that point, like, I was in the best shape of my life in terms of basketball shape. uh, And I was such in the zone. I was locked in. You know, the business was, was doing so well. We had potential clients coming in 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 the upcoming month and we're doing so well and then like they took all this away and this is for everybody this is worldwide but for me uh, on the personal level they took the 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 third thing that i love the most after god and family which is basketball and that really has messed me up i would say this entire year and it got me out of my zone out of my comfort level um it's just it's it's affected me in ways that till now talking about it out loud and just recently thinking about like, man, like uh, I was seeing, I was watching videos of myself. Like, man, I was like, man, I'm, I was so smooth. I was in great shape. And like, I, I'm looking back at things and I haven't been the workhorse that I was leading up to that point. And even, you know, two, three years before that, one can say I was just burnt out. Another thing to say is just, they took something, something so valuable for me and I haven't been yeah. able to find that, that zone again. So how can I help myself moving forward and maybe other people who who have battled with something like this? Well, I think that you took the step right there by by saying it out loud. And because when you do, number one, you know, we own that. But then also too, like you you open it up for dialogue because the monologues in our head are a lot worse than the dialogues we have with people that that love us, that care about us. And when you open it up now, I mean, you and I are just getting to know each other, but I could tell you right off the top that I relate to everything you said. And now the thing that was your private, you know, it was the Leo issue is now the mm-hmm. issue that a lot of us are, are, are feeling. And I think sometimes during stuff like pandemic, 
I hear it a lot around talks around trauma too. People always go, well, someone's got it worse. Like someone had more trauma yeah. than me or someone got hit harder during COVID. Well, yeah, but you know what? Like it's all relative. And at the end of the day, we're what we are suffering gigantic losses in our rhythm and our routines. Like, you yeah. know, and like, and, and that impacts us in so many different ways, including in our mental health. I, I said time and again, from the beginning of pandemic, in every interview I did, I said, look, what's best for the pandemic from a medical standpoint, simply from the disease standpoint, is absolutely unequivocally in opposition to what's best for, for our mental health. Now, am I saying prioritize mental health over disease prevention? No, I'm just simply pointing that out. So we've all been given um, probably the, the most toxic cocktail of, of the last year in terms of a recipe for, our, uh, for disaster with our mental health. You know, we've been isolated. <laughs> uh, yeah. We've we've been thrown out of routine. All of the, the self care practices that, that we had going to the gym. Um, you know, I, I count self care going to a Kings game man. that lights me up. I'm extroverted. It lights me up. That's gone. Uh, going to live music's gone, going to restaurants, the social elements We're creatures that are meant to have a sense of community and belonging. When that's disrupted, it throws us off, man. Like all those things have been thrown off. So I think, um, you know, going back to like your question specifically for yourself is just like, is realizing that we're all feeling that and the level to which we feel it, it's okay to say like, man, that rocked me. Cause I'm right there with you. Like I look at where I was at a year ago and I'm like, yeah. damn. And, and if I sit in that and I don't talk about it out loud, yeah. <laughs> I just beat myself up all day and I fall further in, in the hole. Um, I think that the optimism is, is that hopefully we start to get a few things opening back up so we can get those routines back going. And then the other thing I would just say to that is, it's it's like anything in life, man. It's all it's all that rhythm and routine. The same rhythm that we're in now, being out of routine, we can find the same rhythm of being right back. And that's the beauty of those patterns is just getting right back to what worked before. It's not about reinventing the wheel. It's it's, it's doing what worked before, and with time, trust the process, and it all comes back. And do you think with people taking these vaccines that we're getting closer to that day to potentially having basketball back inside gyms? Well, I'll tell you, it's in, I think the answer is yes. Uh, I think certainly, I mean, this is just pure speculation to this mm -hmm. point of what I've heard from, you know, friends or colleagues that are working inside leagues. But, you know, I, I've been told uh, from someone here locally that, that works um, in a capacity with the team in Sacramento here that that's been the goal and that there's a clear path to it um, before the end of the season to have – I can't remember the number that was said, but it was a lot of right. fans. And so I think that's that's coming. Um, the other thing that's different, too, man, is that, like, you know, for my work, I travel a lot. And when you go to other states, just the way that California is viewing it versus other states, I'm not taking a stance and saying it's right or wrong. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, you know, there's paths that they've created to doing that. And so I think eventually, especially with vac with the vaccines increasing, I think, uh, yeah, I think the path is there. And I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I just can't wait, like, they say that you don't appreciate something until it's gone. Well, man, I'm going to appreciate every element of that. game. I was watching the jazz game the other night, yeah. um, the pass, and and I was hearing them talk about it. Like, man, we missed this. I'm like, dude, I, I might fly to Utah just to see a game. You know, like I might just because I miss it so exactly. bad. Exactly, exactly. And at least, you know, Atlanta, Utah, they have fans. And I've also traveled a lot in the past six months, I would say. I've, I've been all over the nation, actually. Uh, working on a documentary named uh, Unconstitutional. And obviously, we won't get into that, but that's Ooh, I'd love something. to hear about it, though. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's something that, uh, that it's given me perspective on different states, how politics play a huge role in a lot of things, good or bad, however people want to talk about it. But, you know, it's just, it's just in Florida, right? I was like, damn, like, it's different out here. It's not secluded. It's real not... different in Florida. I've been there a lot too. It's crazy. Huh? It's crazy, bro. And it just gives you like, you know. And this is this may sound stupid or silly or uh, uh, insensitive, but you're like, does COVID exist in Florida because of how open, because of how normal it feels, right? Oh, it's 
the, the two places that, that I've gone a lot during pandemic was Tampa, Florida. I have a, a one NFL guy, okay. uh, Chris Godwin, who's on the Bucks, oh, wow. And so I was there all season with him off and on. Did you and go to the Super Bowl? I got, what's that? Did you go to the Super Bowl? No, man, I didn't. I was traveling, <laughs> seeing someone else. And yeah, oh, man. No, so I, I didn't make it there. I made it for some other games this year. Um, and I went to Atlanta. That was other places. Those two states, I'm telling you, like, like you said, you're looking around like, wait a minute. And, you know, um, I mean, it, it, again, like you said, it's not to take a take a side yeah. or be insensitive. But I mean, dang, like, it's kind of nice for a moment at least to just be able to like go move a little bit and not have that in the back of your mind. Um, whether right or wrong, I'm yep. just telling you when you're there, it's, it's kind of nice. It really is. And even just like going to Cancun and it being just different, right? Even for a week, you know, not, and I'm not saying don't wear your masks, right? But be, the rules stated it was a little bit different and it just felt Again, like how you said, you don't know what you have until you lose it. And just being there for a week was just like, man, this is what normal feels like. And this is what we take for granted. And then maybe if, if you do take a sign, you're like, well, maybe if we just follow the damn just, uh, instruction, then we could have gotten to this faster. Yeah, That's like, a whole I mean, separate conversation, right? But again, just the idea of that normalcy again, it, it just puts things in, in perspective. And, you know, it's... It's how we're going to get back to our routines, to our comfort zones, to us being locked in, right, as, as entrepreneurs, media entrepreneurs, doctor for yourself, just anybody, man. And um, lately, I've been hoping, uh, obviously, apparently in Rockland, it's legal because I was like, do you want to, obviously, I know I have a big platform here in Sacramento, and I, and I, and I was asking the guy, I was like, hey, is this legal? He goes, yeah, like it's legal statewide and i was like how is it that a private gym this is where i get confused like how is that a private gym can open but not like an actual gym and he was like well because those gyms have weights and and all that and it's not sanitary blah 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 and i was like man there's so many loopholes to finding ways to get open and obviously i wasn't complaining because i was playing basketball again last week but still i was like oh okay um and, and again like what do we do about those loopholes? Like, is it fair for some people, for other people's livelihoods are on the line, right? Where they can't open people who are downtown, who, who invested their entire life savings to open gyms and they really haven't been able to open it and, and be successful, man. Yeah. I, I mean, as, as we know, th this can of worms is big. We could, we could open yeah. it and, and, and look around it. I mean, it, at the end of the day, I think the thing we agree on for sure, probably most of it, but the thing we definitely agree on is it's, it's about time to just figure out a way to, to right. get back, right? And some version of it, we got to get back. No doubt. So let's talk a little bit about, about the Kings. Right now, they're going on a low losing streak. Some fans are unhappy. And as mm. I said the other night, man, Kings fans got... I don't know if it's like, and, and I don't say, I mean, it's in this insensitive way, but like PTSD because they've lost for 15 straight years. And just, they're just so unstable from a fan perspective because if if they win two in a row, they're going to the playoffs and they're winning the championship. But if they lose two in a row, it's the end of the world and they're the worst team. And it's just such an extreme. And I, obviously losing for 15 straight years has done that to them. But you're a doctor. What can they do to help themselves alleviate so much tension when the team does go on a losing streak? <laughs> Man, what what can they do to help? Yeah. Are we talking about the fan base or the players here? The fan base, because because the players are getting paid no matter what, and obviously they hate losing, but still the fans take it to heart and they take it to a whole different extreme in terms of losing. I think you brought up a good point. I, I don't. I think what it makes me think of is this: is that you know, like emotional swings, especially the negative emotions, give us a sense of tunnel vision. Yeah. So when we're depressed, we all know what that's been like, right? If you've ever been depressed, it's like a fog, and you can't see anything else but just that that's in front of you, and then you project out what you see in front of you to the rest of your life. It's all bad. That's what we're doing a lot of times. I think it's a fan base when we see ourselves struggle. And that, to your point, the PTSD point is probably actually on point because, you know, I, I think that's always fascinating to me. Like, I, I'm a San Francisco Giants fan. Yeah. And I was really observing in 2010 how 
I was watching us bump up against uh, as we were obviously excelling to a point of going on to win the World Series that year. We were bumping up into the old narrative constantly, and the old narrative was we were going to choke in, in a big moment. Um, and so I think it's interesting to look at the stories and the narratives that fan bases have around their sports teams. And in the case of being a Kings fan, um, I mean, there's no doubt that we got PTSD. And what happens when every time that you've you've seen these teams, you know, have in our minds, you know, pretty big streaks, which in the reality of the rest of the NBA probably isn't, but then all of a sudden <laughs> goes right back the other way. It's like, okay, here we go again. Here we go again. So, I mean, I think some of it's perspective, but then I think also too, like there is something like, you know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over expecting different results. I mean, I know you brought this up before, but, um, you know, in some ways I, I can understand where fans are coming from me, myself being one of them and that, you know, just, at times when you see things being put together, I'll, I'll speak specifically to this team. Okay. The frustrating thing for me is watching us build a sustained stretch like we did there, you know, over those eight or nine games. Yep. Look like we were turning a corner. Look like team culture was coming around. Look like the defensive principles were being applied. And then all of a sudden, go out the other night, you know, albeit to a good Brooklyn team right. and then watch them, you know, break the three point record for franchise history. You know, I mean, it's 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 those things that are super frustrating. And I think Luke Walton's an easy target mm -hmm. um, also because uh, whether right or wrong, he just isn't. I mean, you see him get demonstrative on the sidelines, but, you know, he's not the guy that's going to come out and cuss his team out in a press conference. Right. He's always going to kind of keep. You know, well, we did some things right. And at a certain point, we're like, man, like, like you, you got to say something, you know. So I I, I answered it a, a ton of different ways. I think there's yeah. some PTSD. I think we, we, we go right back into this old narrative that we bring back up because we get this tunnel vision. Um, and part of it, though, I would say, too, is valid. Like, is this team really turning a corner? We're always asking ourselves that question. Is this time going to be different? Is this time going to be different? And, um, you know, thus far, it hasn't proved to ever be different for a sustained period or stretch. Do you believe that the Kings winning or just sports in general, like when you're a big time fan can really affect your mood swings and how say the following day goes for you in a positive or negative way? Of course, man. I mean, and again, like, I mean, I, I, I've heard some old heads, like, when you ask them, oh, you still watch the league? They're like, no, I had to give that up. <laughs> like, what do you mean you had to give that up? Because it got to me too bad. Like, I'm like, yeah. I never understood it until I finally, like, reflected on what you just said. Yeah, like, there are times, and, and that's always the dance, right? Like, of when do you allow yourself to emotionally invest? I haven't allowed myself to emotionally invest in the Sacramento Kings, like fully invest, you know, it's like I'm dating, like we're not gonna give, I'm not even talking about marriage with you. Like I'm not allowing myself to fully emotionally invest. It's probably been, um, man, since like the Jaeger run they were on or something like that, like it's been a minute. Um, and so we almost like protect ourselves, but you better yeah. believe in the times when I've been all in, like, oh yeah, like <laughs> you really let your guard down, you really start believing something's different. <laughs> that there's nights it's hard to go to sleep it's frustrating the next day you're kind of pissed off you know like oh yeah i mean it, i think it definitely is true what do you what do you think thousand percent man like if my wife comes in the room when it's a post game that we won i'm the best husband in the world and when they lose i'm like Argh! you know it's just obviously i have to work on that with uh, within me and try not to you know uh, have the Kings affect my mood swings because I have to be a better pro about it. But obviously, even being right a member of the media, like I can't be at games. Yeah, like we score. Like I have to be like even keel, just watching. I'm like, damn. And that's why. And and that's what I tell people. Like it's dope what I do, but never take for granted going to a game, being able to yell and 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 just cherish those moments with just random people. Or if if you're with family members, like I had to take my brother out to a Laker game. Kings Lakers on the road and I said I ain't covering this game I'm going as a fan and that just that was such a great time like obviously th this is dope right being able to interview players interact cover the game but 
being a fan, man, and this goes back to what you said, never take it for granted. It's an amazing feeling. And even though Kings fans haven't had the best of luck the past 15 years, 0203, best years of this franchise, which apparently you covered, and I, and I want to get into that a little bit. But again, never take those moments for granted, man, and you know, cherish those. But again, if you can work on your mood swings just when they do lose, if it's not just the Kings, the Giants, the Raiders, like, same thing. Like, I love my Raiders. I love Las Chivas, right, in uh, Mexican soccer. And every time <laughs> they lose, it's just like, damn, like, it's, it sucks. It's, I root for none but losing teams, bro. So I've been, like, on the downswing for a long time. <laughs> who, wait, who are you? Who are your team? Okay, are you a baseball guy, too, or no? So I'm an athletics. Uh, okay. I, I'm the A's. Uh, and I... I fell in love with baseball in 2014. I didn't understand it growing up. Obviously, I never played it. Uh, so I had to start gambling on it to really appreciate it. And, <laughs> and no, no, seriously, like I because it, it was so boring to me. But that's because I didn't understand the game. And when you understand the game, it's a beautiful damn game. So oh. w- once you understand it, uh, it, you love it. So I, 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 I've been an A's fan. I just chose the A's, obviously, because I'm, uh, I'm a Raider fan. And I'm like, well, everybody's a Giants fan. And there's a bunch of bandwagons. I was like, nah, I, I ain't choosing them. No offense. So the A's, the Kings, Chivas, uh, Chelsea in the uh, Premier League. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, you can't. In 2014, we wouldn't have allowed you. We already had two rings. We were about to get our third. <laughs> we would not allow you to adopt us. Like, that just... No, nah, man, like, especially if you like other teams that are on the underdog story. I'm a I'm a diehard Giants fan. Since yeah. that was, baseball is my first love. Kings being from Sacramento. And then right. the third team I, I fell in love with because of probably similar to you. I was like, I can't be on the bandwagon. I couldn't be a Niners fan growing up. Right. And there was a team I watched every Sunday on NBC because AFC used to be on NBC. Yeah. And this team always was playing in the snow and they had – this running back that was catching passes and running hard. They had this 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 DN that was gigantic, like the biggest the dude I've ever seen. Buffalo Bills, man. I, I'm, a, I'm, a die, <laughs> I'm a diehard Buffalo Bills fan. And like in my lifetime, if you meet if, if you're out here in SAC and you meet yeah. any Bills fans, you are obligated to get their number, follow them on Instagram, hit them up. Like that's your family, man. You just found out 23 and Me came back, and that's your cousin. You're like. Facts. Damn, I guess you gotta come like come over or something, man. Or what are we doing on Sunday? Because you just don't meet Bills fans. Have you um, been to a Bills game? Never. Well, I've been to Bills road games. I've been to a couple games in Kansas City, uh, San Francisco, Oakland, uh, but I've never been to Buffalo. And uh, I got two kids. Uh, my son's gonna be five. My daughter will be three this year, and uh, they're getting into it. So strategically i'm like eventually i want when i go i want to bring them and also i'm not going to go until like all the tables are being broken and all that stuff's going on again because you can't right. go to a bills game and truly partake in bills mafia if they're not jumping off roofs onto folding tables and like doing the whole thing like i gotta experience the whole 100 percent. so uh 100%. yeah i'm hoping to do that like next year or something that's awesome and congrats on you guys making it to the afc championship game losing to that team I hate and 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 the Chiefs, but uh, hey, y'all have a bright future. I love your quarterback. Not more than my, and that's the thing. Like, I hate the Chiefs so much, but man, like I can't really hate on Mahomes. Like, it's just like I got like the Patrick Mahomes hair now, and like I got like the Patrick <laughs> Price from State Farm, and I was like, damn, like why do you gotta play for the Chiefs for, man? But hey, y'all have a bright future, man, and. That was fun to watch you guys play, and you guys beat us this year too. So yeah, that was a tough game. Yeah, that was, you guys were you guys had a lot of injuries. Yeah, we uh, did in that game. Um, yeah, Allen got I, hurt that game, and I think he came back, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I mean J- Josh Allen, man, he's just different. Like you'll just, you know, it, my 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 forty five second Buffalo Bills plug is just yeah. simply that you know McDermott, and it probably relates to the Kings, is that McDermott yeah. came in. And Brandon Bean came in, the coach and general manager, and they cleaned house. And there was, you know, one holdover, Jerry Hughes, from that old regime. And it hasn't been that long since they took over. And they went the classic overcorrection from Rex Ryan, players coach, to all of a sudden culture guy. 
Um, but Sean McDermott's able to also instill a good relationship with players. But they really brought in like the right kind of guys, you know, high character, um, you know, uh, guys, but also talent. They had a, they had an eye for talent. Brandon Bean's been really good um, in, in doing that. And uh, yeah, man, Josh Allen, he's just, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, how do you get, how do you have that strong of an arm? complete you know 50 55 percent 56 percent at wyoming and then you go to the league and you're now completing you know close to 70 percent of your passes in the that's nfl nuts that it's he just, played at wyoming like i went to unr and we had kaepernick and i just realized i was like wait he played at wyoming like that's i mean that's one of the schools that we that we hate i was like damn that's like the Dame Lillard equivalent to Weber yeah. State, right? Yeah. Like, that's the only, like, you're like, what? Like, how did that happen, right? Right, right. And talking about Josh Allen, how we can just transition into tanking versus not tanking, right? You just talked about culture. We have, mm. we, by we, the Kings have their Josh Allen and De'Aaron Fox. Yes. So why would you not want to surround him with the best talent possible? Now, I understand the tanking perspective for a small market team. You want to, the only way realistically to get a star is through the draft because free agents won't want to come here, especially when you are a bunch of losers where you've been losing for 15 straight years. And that's my counter argument to all this. So when people say, well, why are you thinking short term? Why do you want to make the playoffs now? It's make the playoffs and then just suck forever. I'm like, wait, wait, when you make the playoffs, that's a domino effect. And just like the Blazers team, when they lost Aldridge and, like, three starters, it was Dame's team, and he was a young kid. CJ McCollum was, I think, in year number two. And then that year, they were supposed to be one of the worst teams, and they've never missed a playoff since, or maybe, like, once. But they've been legit ever since because you put that responsibility on a young, great player, and that's what I think the Kings have in De'Aaron Fox. He's going to take you places, man. And for me, it's all about establishing the right culture. And with this idea of getting rid of good players like Harrison Barnes, Buddy Heald, fans want to trade them to get assets. Obviously, that's a form of tanking because you're getting rid of good players that help out De'Aaron Fox because he can't do it all. This is a team game. So when you take players away for assets, draft picks, you're getting worse. So... That doesn't make sense to me when you're trying to build a winning culture. And and that's my argument to every single person who wants to tank. And like, well, this upcoming draft is great. Cool, man. You just landed Tyrese Halliburton at number 12. If you have the right scouting department and, and, and you have a, a competent GM, you can draft somebody good. If you look at all our all-star superstars, a lot of them were drafted like 12 and up. Kawhi's, you know, Giannis's, and the list goes on. So yep. let's not act like top 10 picks are automatically superstars because that's not the case. And historically speaking, it's a small probability. Yeah, and I think, you know, we always, I mean, my company's called Cheat Code. Like we're always looking for the cheat code and the hack. Mm-hmm. We want to simplify things. I think when it comes to this stuff, Unfortunately, it's a it's a heavy lift and it's a long it's a long road in, in many cases to build culture. And I don't think that everything that Vladi did, um, you know, was all for naught. And there were there were some yeah. elements of that. Obviously, some personnel he brought in, some things he did um, with the team. But there's no doubt that at the end of the day, I don't care what sport it is, you're not going to be successful if you don't do two things: one, pick the right guys more often than not, and then number two, develop those guys. And that's when it comes back to culture, culture and your process for selection, culture and your process and development. I think for the longest time, we, you know, we look back and we know it's well cataloged, right? I'm sure you got carousels on your Instagram feed of all the picks that we missed out on. Yep. Uh, it, it's really well documented. Um, but I think the other part of that too is can we develop that? So, you know, going back to what you, what your point is now, I just don't think it's a one size fits all model to get better. The only way to get better is to tank. And, Right. You know, I thought I, I thought it was interesting too. I think uh, recently the Bulls, um, Thaddeus Young, they were talking about his role in that team and how it was really important to have him around. For uh, Donovan was talking about having him around for for building the culture and building up some of those those young guys. And and Pop, I know, made a similar comment that I think you had had shared on social yep. around that too. And so there's a value 
to being competitive. And, and here's the other thing that's really, it's a really tenuous thing. You know, this is a player's league more than it's ever been. Yep. You know, truly, this is a player's league. They run the league. They run, they run teams because they can, they can pull up and just tell you, I don't want to play for you, bro. And like, they can force their hand. <laughs> so simple. let me tell you right now, we're pretty damn lucky that De'Aaron Fox is as loyal as he is, as dedicated as he is to this, this team and this organization. Um, but let's also not take that for granted. Like this idea that, oh yeah, De'Aaron's going to be here no matter what. Like, you know, it's all good. No, at a certain point, De'Aaron can get frustrated with the, with what he's seen and being like, there's no leadership. There's no direction. Y'all had good players that you couldn't do anything with. And now you're telling me we're going a new route. Like, which one is it? So the window of De'Aaron Fox is critical. And I, I personally believe, you know, to your point, I believe that De'Aaron has definitely the potential to be a superstar in this league. Uh, I don't think he's that far from it. He's shown glimpses of that in the last couple months, obviously winning player of the week a week ago to be just that. So let's not mess with with De'Aaron. It it comes down to this. Do we have the right person making picks? Vladi missed on some picks. We we can't debate that he didn't. He did. Luca! Uh, (laughs) I got a story for you on that one. I think I, I, I messaged you about... The Luca pick. I don't yeah. know if you want me to go there real quick. Go, I'll just go, say go, this: go, 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 Is go. McNair better better at making selections than Vladi is? If so, that's a huge piece of the culture. The second is the development, and I'm not so certain that we totally are there yet, but I think we're a lot closer. Um, I'm just gonna tell you this real quick story about Vladi. The night before the Luca draft, um, I'm riding my bike with my kid on the back in mm-hmm. Midtown, and we're coming out. Uh, we're coming around the corner near um, Centro, or not Centros, um, Paisanos over in that area over there, right? And I see Vladi, and you know, mind you, as you alluded to, when I had a show way back in the day, I would interview Vladi in the locker room. I knew there's no way this dude would remember me, like especially. I mean, it was a long time ago. I was a kid when I was doing that. Anyway, yeah. I see Vladi, and I'm like, "Hey, Vladi, you mind taking a picture with my son?" Sure, no problem, right? He's walking with one of his other year he's always like one or two european dudes with him right yeah so and they're smoking cigarettes of course yep. right and so vladi <laughs> you know puts the cigarette out for a minute all uh, right let me take this picture great guy love vladi man yeah and, me too uh go take the picture and i this is i mean i'm telling you 100 percent, this is real i say to him say luca on three as they're going to take the picture just like messing around oh, with him. Shit. I'm, this is 100% real. People are going to you know, right. think I'm, I'm lying. I'm not. But it's all good if you don't believe me. But I swear to God, I said to him, say Luca on three. And he literally goes, I can't do that. And I was oh like, oh, my God. So we take the picture. And right after, I was like, well, you could say it tomorrow, though, right? And he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> now, I'm thinking to myself, Vladi and I talked for about three minutes about this, right? In the, in the conversation, I straight up say, no, Luca? And then he starts telling me about just, well, no, we know something about him that no one else does. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you right now, he said that to me. We know something about him that no one else does. Oh my and then we start talking about Porter, and we start talking about some of the other guys in the draft. Ultimately, he alludes in as many different ways about it being Bagley and whatever. So I walked away. I text all my friends who are diehards. I was like, bro. I'm crushed. Like Luke is not the pick. It, it's Bagley, you know. Um, so, but bottom line, it was always like on my mind. Like, what is that thing that he knows? And I, I can't name too many names, but I'll just right. tell you that there was a, a reporter in the NBA that we were trying to get to the bottom of this together. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it. I'll leave it at that. Apparently, there was something that he knew, but it was wasn't as big as as Vladi made it out to be, obviously. For and sure, of course, yeah. The rest is history. But his mind was made up, man, the night before. That, I mean, his mind was definitely made up. And, uh, yeah. His just, mind just was crazy. made up, and I found this out. I don't know if it was two or three days now, but it was two or three days when I found out that Luca wasn't the guy. And back to the whole emotions thing, like, I was sick to my stomach for the next two days because I knew... Obviously, it's common sense, like, okay, well, it has to be Bagley, but I wasn't like a thousand percent sure it was Bagley, but I had a hunch it was Bagley, but I knew for a fact it wasn't Luca, and I was sick, bro, and 
now you saying this is just it just reaffirms everything it's just like my gosh and obviously both Eman and i had to keep her mouth shut but we were sick and obviously we know revision of the history like hindsight 2020 what it could have been with De'Aaron Fox and Luka Doncic, but that's that's a crazy story, bro. Like that's I'm I'm speechless, man. You can't, you know, and I mean, it goes back to the point. Really, the point of the story is essentially that you got to pick the right guys, right? And you know, and that's the the question is is that is McNair the guy that can do that? And at least with his pick last year, you know, um, you you look at that with a lot of optimism. You have to pick and you have to develop them. Uh, to me, I, I'm curious from your perspective, how, how, how do I, because I'm not sure that I know the answer to the development part. Do you believe that we have the right personnel in place? You know, Draymond Green came out the other day and, yep. and was, was critical of the league around that, right? Um, saying that, you know, it's not all on the players. The, the league, the team's got to develop these guys. How do you, how do you quantify or how do you judge whether or not the Kings have the ability to develop these guys and, and do you feel like they they have the ability to develop them not just pick them well my honest opinion i've said this multiple times to me De'Aaron fox fell to vlade divac and he had no choice but to draft them just like demarcus fell to the kings a, uh, a decade ago when he should have been like top two pick um and i obviously Halliburton fell to the kings so how much credit is that to vlade to Monte, honestly, when it was really a screw up from the other teams. Like if those teams had the right guys, right, choosing or the right scouting departments, uh, giving them the right intel, then Tyrese would have never slipped to 12. I mean, I was in shock. And a lot of people say, oh, the 2020 draft is not that good. It's not blah, blah, blah. But I was like, how does a, a player who is this good slide past Detroit at seven, New York at eight, and even Phoenix at 10, when they took the kid from uh, Maryland, I was like, how do you not put Tyrese with Chris Paul and Devin Booker? It just it made no sense. And obviously, the Spurs had a choice between him and the uh, kid from Florida State. He's, 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 his, his name is slipping, but he fell to the Kings. Let, like, let's yeah. not, like, let's not sugarcoat that. And De'Aaron Fox, sure. if the Kings had the number one pick that year, they most likely would have went Markel Fultz, and they love Josh Jackson. So, yes, Vladi hindsight said, oh, well, we would have picked De'Aaron. Like, what do you expect the GM to say when they draft the guy? Like, they have to say certain things like that. Like, you're you right. Know, Monte really saying, oh, we would have drafted. Like, no, like, no, you wouldn't have. <laughs> Stop lying. But that's just what I know. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I know it's, it's, it's a great point, I, that, but I go back to it again. Like, do we have the culture to develop guys? If, if McNair makes the right pick the next three drafts, do we have the culture? I guess a lot of that goes back to your belief in Luke Walton. Um, but, you know, do we have the culture and, and, and what's it going to take, I think, to, to get that next level development of, of who we pick? It's, it's such a tough question because... I want to win now, and I like Luke as a person. I, I think he's a great guy, but as a coach, he's had enough time to where, in my opinion, he hasn't made the right strides to become uh, a top-tier coach. Obviously, there's 30 positions in the NBA, and when people say, oh, we have to fire him to bring on Gentry, and I'm like, well, Gentry's had multiple opportunities to showcase that he's a head coach and he failed at, at and he failed. So to me, they're great basketball minds. But even for me, who I aspire to be a head coach one day, I I don't know at what level or if I'll ever get that opportunity. But you don't know if you're going to become a good coach, regardless of how how much knowledge or how much you know the game. Because being a head coach is honestly being a great leader. Like, are you able to convince guys to buy in? That's really what it boils down to. Like X and O's, yeah, you can be brilliant, but at the end of the day, if you can't convey your message to these grown ass men who are elite at what they do, then it doesn't matter. So yes, Luke comes from a great basketball lineage. We all understand that, but he hasn't made the right strides on so many levels to keep that job. And coming into the year, 
I explicitly said that his job was on the line and that if he didn't coach his ass off, his heart off, he's not going to get another head coaching job within the next two or three years. There's just no way. But I think he's doing a much better job this year. But is it good enough? That's still up for debate. Uh, I'm obviously always willing to give um, give him credit where, where he deserves. And those eight, nine games, they were playing well. So... I think something's there. I think he's becoming a better coach slowly, but is it enough to keep the job down the road? And like you said, if you pick the guys, the the guys can you develop them? Oh man, it's just hard because the Kings always do things backwards. They they always want to hire or for, for purposes <laughs> like hire the coach first and GM, and then it's just a, it's just a redundant thing. And that's the fundamental issue, right? Things start from the top. And if you don't do things right, then a, a lot of things was, okay, well, well, we can't fire Luke in the pandemic because he has a huge contract and we don't want him to sit home and make millions because we're so paying Dave and we're paying this guy, whatever minority owners get involved, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, bro, you got to just take the loss and just start fresh. Allow your new GM to bring on his guy because Dave wasn't Vladdy's guy and he said that multiple times when a lot of people thought it was the truth and it wasn't the truth. So now it's like he brings in Luke, his guy, he gets fired and it's just a constant domino effect and that's why the Kings don't have a positive winning culture because they do things backwards and they do True. things the wrong way. So it's the positive optimist in me is like, yes, I want them to win and if that happens, Luke will probably get the nod and get another chance um but so be it like he's young enough to learn and become a better coach gentry i think he's great at what he's doing which is being like his 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 main assistant which is fine but it's it's just such a complex uh a question and it's, it's hard to answer because i my gut says luke isn't the guy but if they do make the playoffs some way this year then you got to give him another year because last year with so many injuries and the pandemic and the bubble, like the Kings were so hot before the pandemic hit and they would have made the playoffs in my opinion. But then when the pandemic hit, they had COVID stuff and guys are not in the lineup. And there's been a lot of weird miscellaneous things with Luke. So it's, it's tough, man. And, and this year in the first, cause I break down a lot of film for people and that's what I love. Like I'm aspiring to be a coach. So I've noticed that in the first two quarters, his play design, his offensive actions have been really good, a huge improvement from last year. But defensively, they still don't have an identity. And that's a big no-no because he's known, he was known to be a good defensive coach. And obviously, there's a little bit with not having the right bodies, the right personnel, right? So just like anything else, he played 3 4, four 3 defense. They don't have the right guys. Okay, that's fine. But still, like, they don't have an identity. They don't protect the paint well, they half assed that. They give up too many threes. They half ass that. Like, you either got to do one or the other, and they don't do either. So that's where, to answer your question in a thousand different ways, I'm not sure. It's it's tough. <laughs> I learned a lot, though, from listening to that. I mean, I mean that, like, sincerely. Like I, yeah. There's a lot of good nuggets in what you said. And, and, and one of the nuggets that I took away is, Luke's not your guy right now. I mean, I, I, what I hear, I know that – Yeah. I know it's not – black and white and we yep. want to do like the shock jock thing and like yep. Luke's got to go, you know, or, or Luke's the man. I know it's not that easy, but what I'm hearing you say is your gut's telling you Luke's not the move. And I think if, if you're McNair, you probably are saying to yourself, I want my guy in there, right? Yeah. Like you, 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 because Luke's not doing enough to, to sway you the other way. And I think right. that's always been the frustration. So it's like, he's so damn in the middle. Yeah. In terms, of, <laughs> you can't fire him. You can't, he's that dude flying under the radar. Like, you know, and yeah, then like if he, like you said, we get the eighth seed, we go in, we get bounced. Like even then, well, we got to give him another. It's like, dang, man, your whole career, it's like that Monty Kiffin route, like yeah. name yeah. recognition from, you know, slash people assuming that you can do better than maybe you've proved you can. And like, it's just frustrating, man. Um, but he is in that weird purgatory of you got to let him ride it out a little bit. Yep. Um, and, and, I, and it's easy to scapegoat Luke all day. For but sure. I, the thing For that sure. bugs me, and I know you're a big buddy guy. Yep. Regardless of what Buddy says about you know him appreciating Luke more recently or whatnot, I just don't understand. This is the eye test thing as a Kings fan. I don't understand how Buddy Heel looked like he was on the verge 
not that long ago, mm-hmm. uh, prior to his benching in terms of yeah. what I can remember as a fan, you would know better than I. How does he go from being that guy that to me is like right on the edge of being a star in this league to a guy that disappears on on, yeah. on many different nights? Like he's there, but I mean, to me, like that's one element. There's more, but yep. you know, like that's one thing that I just I, I've never been able to understand. And I think true good coaches find a way to, like you said, create the culture, but get the most out of their personnel. Exactly, you're not getting the most out of Buddy Heald. I mean, no. I'm sorry, you just never have. I don't think they got the most out of Bogdan either. Yep. Uh, you know, you could argue that about Bagley. I mean, like th- those are the issues to me where it's like, man, he's he's on thin ice. And that's exactly why. It, that's exactly why for me it's hard for me to say, well, he's the guy. Obviously, again, my gut says he's not the guy. But if they somehow win this year, and a lot of it, it's going to fall on De'Aaron Fox, right? You're going to go as far as De'Aaron Fox takes you regardless of what Luke does. Like at the end of the day, this is a player's league. Town's going to uh, outweigh anything, and great coaches can take you so far, right? Just George Carl, quick example before I let you go because I want to be respectful for your time, but why he couldn't be Michael Jordan didn't matter. Like, they were just a better team. They had better players. Like, you can only do so much as a head coach, and I can only imagine if uh, a, a, a top-tier head coach was on this team and how much they could get out of this current roster. And as you said, I think they'd get a lot more. But Luke is learning. Obviously, he's, he's still young, like really young for, See, for, for how, a head coach. But look how we do it. We're, giving ex- we're making excuses yeah, for him. It's, that, it's, it's that's tough. Like, I'm trying to be politically all, correct. All want to make. <laughs> but, man, you know yeah. what? Like. We yeah. all want to do that for Luke. I'm just sorry. The only thing I know before we go, too, is yeah. just because we're talking about the roster. Am I the only one? Like, you watch the film. White Sign's got to get a little more run, right? Or, or no? No. He needs to play 15 to 22 minutes max a night. Um, and, and the big reason why is, as I've alluded to all year long, if I'm an opposing coach, I'm going to put this large man who's slow-footed in the pick and roll every single time and just in the last game. You know, I was like, how do the Nets go on a 20-0 run? The casual fan will say, well, they didn't play any defense. Okay, but what happened? There's a why, right? There's a schematic issue there during that 20-0 run. It's not just they didn't play defense or there was no ball movement. Like, no, there's a why to all this. What really happened? And I delve into it. I went uh, First, I watched it myself. Then, then I went live. And then... You're just like, damn, like Whiteside does this every single night where he gets lost, he gets caught in no man's land, flat footed, not really knowing what to do. Like James Harden is going to bring his ass in a pick and roll. And they, and that's the thing why even a guy like Gobert, who's great, like different leagues, right? This is a defensive player of the year type guy, great player. But in the but playoffs, still, it's that but, same move. But, yeah, it, right. but in the playoffs, like, at times, he's unplayable because he doesn't give you that much offensively. And if he's just defensive-oriented, which Whiteside is great in the paint. But as soon as you take this man out of the paint, it's a whole different ball game, And he's such a liability, which is why Rashawn Holmes is so much better. And it, it just shows, like, and this is his, his, his thing. Like, people know this about Whiteside. He could be the best player in the world, like the best big man in the world. But he doesn't bring it here mentally. and He's not locked in every night and that's okay because everyone can't be great and i tell people this all the time it's like everybody can't be a top 10 player it takes a certain individual a certain player to be great like guys show up just like you and me or you know eight to five like there are certain guys that will put the extra five hours on top of that to be great extra three hours in film session like everyone doesn't have to be there it just happens that they're great at what they do they're great athletes, so obviously they're in the NBA. But everybody can be a top ten player, man, and I don't blame him for that. But uh, but I also acknowledge that he's not that guy, so that's why I can't expose him as a coach to play him X amount of time. And again, last game he had a great statistical game, but he did in the blog game where it, it just got. First of all, the Nets don't play defense, and when <laughs> they were up twenty eight points. They for sure weren't playing any, any more defense. So White Side got a lot of that. Kojo, God bless his heart. I think he's a great human being, but he's a French <laughs> NBA player. He's not yeah. a good basketball player. Uh, shout out to his agent for getting him 13 mil a season. God diggity. 
uh, and and for Vladi for giving him that contract. But again, those are Vladi uh, coaches of uh, a Vladi guy that he's gonna be hard to move because he has this year and he has a following year. And you know, to say he's a locker room guy, I can't justify paying a locker room guy thirteen million dollars a year. There's just no way. And those unless are my he's frustrations. coaching the team, unless he's Luke Walton's <laughs> exactly. And we're going to go. That's how we save money. And we find out, are you really a locker room guy? Right? Exactly. Go coach the team, man. What do we got to lose, right? Exactly. So it's 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 those type of things. The Kings have to improve their bench, which is why I'm, I'm hoping that the Kings are in full circle. I hope the Kings are buyers and not sellers. My gut says they're going to be sellers uh, because Monte has used the word flexibility a lot, uh, which is – a little bit of tanking in there, right? We know what that means. Um, so uh, I hope that in, in, in these next five games, they go at least three and two and they bring that spark back. Or if they go four and one, I'd be really good. And then that put the pressure on Monte and make his decision even more difficult to say, damn, like, should I just give up some picks to to solidify this bench and commit to the playoffs? Because that's what, what would happen. Like the Kings would make the playoffs, make, make no mistake. But it's a it's a matter of him making that decision because right now they're in the middle, right? Like they either got to get rid of Buddy and Barnes and get assets, or they got to make a run for that. And I I'm on this side because De'Aaron Fox is 23. He's only gonna get better from here. Like, how do you get worse when you taste the playoffs? Like he all he talks about is literally everyone talks about the playoffs. I want to know what it feels like. And you're depriving this man of the playoffs by getting rid of his good players. Like th- this makes no sense. And as you said. This is a player-driven league. He can say, I'm trying to balance. Like, this organization sucks. They don't want to put the best players around me. And that's what I've been preaching from day one, bro. So I hope they're buyers, but my gut says that they're going to be sellers. You think Holmes gets signed long-term? He needs to. Like, that's part of, like, me saying fans disrespect him because they see him as a hustle guy, but he does so much more that a box score will never show. Like, he makes winning plays. He's... he impacts winning, something that Whiteside doesn't do. Whiteside pats the stats, and I got this from the Heat, and I got this from the Blazers. There's a reason why he's on the veteran minimum on this Sacramento Kings. Like, there's no secret well, to this, man. And I think, too, you know, to that point, it's a really great, like, you know, Mike, I brought up Whiteside because I know you watch more film than me. Yeah. I know you're more plugged in than me. And that's why I'm, I'm asking you, because from my perspective, there are times where I want Whiteside to play, but but don't get it twisted. I'm a, I'm 37 years old. Yeah. I remember when a guy like Hassan Whiteside had a role in this league. Exactly. I think really what that shows is is that uh, you know guys like, I mean guys like Whiteside just don't have a role in this league. And to the the counterpoint, a guy like Rashawn Holmes, you know, 10 years ago would never never be commanding the type of money that we're projecting yep. him to be commanding, and he wouldn't just be a hustle guy. Yep. But in today's NBA, the way it works, switchability, uh, man, switchability is yep. a big thing. Yep, yep, it's a huge thing, bro. So one last thing before I let you go, how can I or my audience, anyone watching this uh, now or in the near future, can help people with uh, mental health uh, issues, or you know, how can we promote uh, mental health awareness, or is there a program that yeah. we can donate, or you know, anything yeah, that yeah. we can help? Well, I'm, I'm going to I'll say two things I say a lot, which is I'm, I'll zoom in and I'll zoom out. I'll first zoom out the bigger picture. Uh, Cheat Code Foundation, as I mentioned to you, is, is I think, a worthy cause that we're, we just got off the ground and we're going to plant our flag uh, first here in Sacramento. We'll do some mm-hmm. stuff in Atlanta and also work in the, um, Asheville, North Carolina in this mm-hmm. year. But um, you can absolutely, from a zoomed out perspective, if you're looking to donate um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll get you some information and in, in how we can direct people to donate. But, um, essentially what our foundation is about is that there are transformative practices in the therapy world that could help people heal from trauma, unlock their true potential and get out there and, and get off the sidelines and get in the game. And we, we also know that there's an issue, not just with stigma, but access. So a lot of people that need the help can't get it. It's too expensive. They don't know where they're not, they're not in network with insurance, all those things. So the idea of the foundation, Chico Foundation, is just trying to figure out how to get the best of the best stuff to people that need it the most for nothing, right? Just for just for showing up because it's the right thing to do. 
So we're going to start a pilot program here in Sacramento. Uh, we're, we're targeting this year. If everything goes well, we raise the funds. And so, yeah, by all means, man, um, would love if you could point some of your listeners in that direction and I'll get you more information on the Cheat Code Foundation. That way we can get some people healed from their trauma and really uh, get them back in the game. The, the other thing I'll say, too, is uh, on a zoomed in level, like how do we individually um, help one another? Right. Um, the worst thing we could do is not ask. The worst thing we could do, you know, I love that you mentioned a couple times. I work a lot with clients on getting them in touch with their intuition and their yeah. instincts because I happen to believe, like Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, that that stuff is really, it's important information. Um, there's a reason why you got sick to your stomach when the Kings weren't going to draft Luca. We yeah. now know why, right? Yeah. Our intuition and our gut sometimes tells us things. I believe. You know, I believe in God. I believe we're connected. And whether or not you believe in God, that's a whole different topic. Yep. But I think the reason I'm going here is to say this. There are times where some of us get a feeling like we should reach out to someone, whether it's an Instagram post that we read between the lines and we, we saw the, you know, like the, the sideways way that someone was looking for, for some love or, or was really struggling and trying to put it out there. There are people right now in your, in your 360 mm -hmm. that are surrounding you that you have some bit of a cue at times to that they're struggling and it's so easy man i do it all the time we get lost in our own stuff but i'll tell you the the best thing for you if you're if you're struggling is to get outside of yourself and serve and listen to that intuition so if there's anyone right now to make it really actionable and you're listening to this and you stumbled onto this and you're like why is leo talking to some mental health guy about you know all this stuff including yeah. basketball what does he know what I'll tell you is this, I'll challenge you. There's gotta be at least one person right now that's crossed your mind in the way that I just mentioned, that you thought to yourself, man, I don't, I don't think he's good. Like I check on that person. What do I say? I'm not a therapist, I don't know what to say. Yeah, just tell him you love him and hey man, I'm thinking about you. We should connect. Amen. Then make it actionable because if that person's depressed or anxious and they're in the midst of that tunnel vision, with, they can't make it actionable. So make it actionable, bro. Is it cool if I pull up on you in a couple of days? Hey, is it cool if I call you? Is it cool? Da, 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 da. And, and take that moment, taken out of context, we all seem strange. Taken out of community, man, we all get messed up and jacked up. We seem strange. So we got to be community to one another, especially during times like this. If there's someone that you have a sense right now may be struggling, reach out to them and just be there and show love and vulnerability. Listen, that's sometimes all it takes to avoid not necessarily the worst thing in a mental health crisis like suicide, but even just, you know, being stuck in dark, deep depression or hopelessness. You could help simply by doing that. Um, prioritize your mental health. It, it's the cheat code. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's what I would say to all the listeners out there. Can't say it any better, man. I appreciate you, doctor, uh, for joining me. It's it was fun. a fascinating conversation. I hope you guys got a lot of out of this. Lots of cool stuff from a King's perspective, from the Luca. I'm literally gonna cut that up right now and just post that like, hey, this is what happened. I'm that That's crazy, bro. That's crazy. But obviously the whole mental health stuff as well, like this, what you just said right now to end the show, can't say any better. Reach out if you know somebody, like go quick text, like, how you doing? I love you. Trust me, man. Like Gary V, I get a text every single day, like the 212 from his, from his mobile number, like, he sends out positive vibes. Something like that keeps you, I don't know, like positive, man. And it's just little stuff like that, bro. So definitely, it man. Makes a difference. Makes a difference. Uh, where can people follow you, man? And, and what type of projects are you working on right now? Yeah, you can follow me at Dr. Mondo. Uh, you can you can also follow, we just, it's soft launch. It's like I got not a whole lot up there, but uh, also cheat code. Just that one word at, on Instagram. Those are the, the platform I use the most. Uh, and yeah, you'll just you'll hear a lot more. We all the work that I did this past year with athletes, I asked them to partner with me, and so that's why the name. I can't name all the names, but some of the yeah. names. Uh, it's not just like me name dropping. It's me actually talking about people that are partnering with me in this movement to end stigma and get access to underserved communities. So Chris Godwin of the Tampa Bay Bucks, Super Bowl winner, uh, which I'm so happy for him. Uh, uh, Dansby Swanson of the Atlanta Braves, D. Gordon, now the Cincinnati Reds, um, uh, Colleen Quigley, who's a Team USA. So we got we got folks that that are really passionate, and you'll be hearing more 
about their mental health stories and how approaching their mental game and being proactive was their cheat code and, and just be expecting more of that because we're trying to uh, tear down the wall of stigma but also try to get ahead of the access issue also. Perfect. And for all the audio listeners after this, listening on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you get your podcast, make sure you drop a review if you enjoyed this action-packed show. Thank you guys so much. God bless every single one of you guys. And we'll see you 